and welcome to the first of our new format uh, dialogues. My name is Tom Dennis. I'm the CEO of Serenity and Leadership, which is a culture change consultancy and training organization. We've done quite a lot of research into the dynamics of the masculine and the feminine and, and how they affect uh, organizations. And one of the things that's very clear to us is that inclusion is an essential element if one is trying to change or bring about change in a, a culture. So that's why we have this focus on inclusion and diversity. Now, the aim in these events, which we're going to be running each month, will be to initiate a dialogue by inviting an expert in the, their field. Today, the subject is uh, taking the fear out of disability. And our speaker is Jane Hatton. Uh, what I'd like to do now is to introduce Jane Hatton. Jane is the CEO of Evenbreak, an award-winning social enterprise which is run by and for disabled people. Their aim is to bring together organizations that want to recruit uh, disabled people and to help disabled people get good jobs. She's been living with disability for 16 years, so she is singularly well placed to speak on the subject of taking the fear out of dis disability. Jane. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen if you just bear with me for two seconds. Excellent. So I've been given 15 minutes and I've got my timer on. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about taking the fear out of disability. And it, those two words might seem as though they don't really go together very well, but I think there is a, certainly a degree of apprehension and fear around disability. But before I go into that, I'd just like to talk about what I mean by disability. In the disability world, and I know many of you know this already, we talk about the different models of disability. And for me, the social model of disability actually speaks loudest. And that talks about people who have a difference. So that could be a long-term health condition. It could be um, issues around mobility or neurological conditions or um, any, uh, what we would call a disability, but they are disabled by society people's attitudes. Um, and so in this particular example, um, the woman in the wheelchair isn't disabled by the wheelchair, she's disabled by the steps. So if we could get rid of stairs, people in wheelchairs wouldn't be disabled. So in my talk today, I'm talking about difference, people who are different from what we consider to be the norm and, um, and who face additional barriers in achieving our everyday lives. So that's just a background of what I'm talking about. It's not just physical disabilities or differences. It can be all sorts of uh, cognitive or uh, mental health issues, all of those kinds of things. So why is it that so many people are frightened of disability? And I think the fundamental thing is that as human beings, we tend to be frightened of difference. We tend to gravitate towards people who are like us, whether that's the same skin color or the same gender or the same age or people who look like us and things that are different can often be seen as um, a bit threatening, a bit unusual, a bit unfamiliar, something we're not really very comfortable around. So there's that kind of almost primeval fear of people who are different. I think the other thing, I don't know if you've seen that there were a couple of documentaries on BBC Two recently about the history of disability and uh, last night about hate crime. And I think that one of the things that frighten people about disability is it's really heavily portrayed as a tragedy. So someone has a baby and the first thing they say is, I don't care whether it's a girl or a boy, so long as it's healthy. And it's as though the worst possible thing that could happen to somebody is to become disabled, you know, to lose our sight, to, to be a wheelchair user, to get a mental health condition. And again, it's natural to be frightened of the unknown, but because we portray disability as a tragedy, it's something that people dread. It's something that they are worried about. And of all the protected characteristics that we talk about in the diversity and equality and inclusion field, it's the one that's most likely to happen to any of us. So we're unlikely to wake up a different gender or a different race, but we could become disabled at any time. We could be run over, we could have an accident, we could acquire a long-term health condition. And I think because of that, there's a kind of almost subconscious fear that I don't really want to think too much about disability because it's a tragedy that might happen to me. And if it happened to me, it would be the end of the world. 
Um, and as we'll see later, you know, it doesn't need to be the end of the world. But there is that kind of, you know, someone said in my little group about changing the dialogue around disability. And very much at the moment is, oh, poor things, what a shame, which we need to kind of get over. I think another very understandable fear around disability is about the embarrassment attached to getting it wrong. So what happens if we use the wrong word and we offend somebody? Or what happens if we want to support somebody, but we don't really know how to do that appropriately without coming across as condescending or patronizing? Or if we use the wrong words, you know, what words do we use these days? What words are politically correct to use? And we're frightened of getting it wrong, using the wrong word, inadvertently causing offense, um, coming over as patronizing or as ignoring somebody. So we're frightened of all of that. What's the etiquette around around disability and that can be a you know a huge thing and my particular interest is about um, the workplace and dis disabled people and their interaction with the workplace and I think again going back to that, that narrative when I talk to employers which I do a lot in my role about employing disabled people they express fears around yeah but what are the consequences of us employing disabled people you know, they could be unproductive. We haven't really got, you know, the bandwidth to have unproductive members of the team. They're going to be expensive. We need all of these adjustments that everybody needs. It's going to really cost us a fortune. Disabled people are going to be off sick. And we always have a problem with sickness absence already without taking disabled people on. Um, and of course, they're going to be a health and safety risk. We're going to trip up over the wheelchairs and the blind people are going to keep walking into things. I'm exaggerating only slightly. Um, and of course, disabled people won't have any skills to offer. So why would you want to employ disabled people? So beyond that whole, we welcome everybody into the organization, there's either a spoken or unspoken fear of, but if we, if we include disabled people in our workforce, we're gonna have all of these problems. And actually disabled people are a problem rather than an asset. So that tends to be the fears of hiring managers or people within the workplace. So, oh, so the impact of that fear is um, on all of us. It, the impact of that fear actually disadvantages all of us. If we look at it from the perspective of the disabled person, I know there's a number of disabled people's, people on this call. Um, the impact of that fear that you know, recruiters or employers think that we're not going to be good in the workplace is that we're not going to be offered jobs. Why would you offer a job to someone who's going to be a, an expensive problem and a risk? Or if we are offered jobs, we're underemployed. So we might be given a job, but the assumption then is, well, disabled people, you know, they're going to be grateful to have a job. They're not going to be ambitious. Why not? We can be as ambitious as anybody else. That fear brings up a lot of barriers um, for disabled people trying to access the workplace. Uh, the barriers of the attitude of the hiring manager or the recruiter, also the, um, the barriers that might be there in the recruitment process because nobody's bothered to see if they're accessible because if we're not going to employ disabled people, it's not important. Um, and also that there feels, um, as a disabled person, I sometimes feel that the onus is on me to make life easier for non-disabled people around me. So if they don't understand the barriers I face, I'm gonna to have to explain it all over again, what the barriers are, what I need people to do to remove those barriers. If people look embarrassed because they don't know what word to use, they don't know what question to ask, I kind of feel as though the onus is on me, not only to explain what I need and to ask for what I need, I've also got to reassure that other person that it's okay, it's okay, I won't be offended. And you can ask me any questions you like and it's okay and i've got to mind put in that position of having to reassure someone else that you know they're okay and the onus is on me to ask for what i need because often i won't be asked disability is the kind of elephant in the room that nobody really talks about because i might use the wrong word or offend someone so i have to ask for what i need sometimes i have to fight for what i need and that's the same for pretty much every other disabled person and the long-term impact of that fear from employers is that disabled people don't get employed. They don't get access to employment or work opportunities or promotion. And disabled people are very much overrepresented in terms of poverty and ill health and the amount of households that have disabled people 
um, within them that suffer from poverty and um, really struggle to get out of that. And that's all to do with things like the benefit structure and everything like that. But also the impact of that fear isn't just on us as disabled people, it's also on employers, businesses, the economy, um, and the whole of society. So if we have that fear that prevents us from employing disabled people, it gives employers lack of access to all of that talent. We're talking about 20% of people of working age who consider themselves to be disabled. And if we're going to not access the talent that those 20% of the people out there have, that's an enormous amount of talent we're missing out on. So we don't get that talent. Um, my view, as I'll say later, is that actually we bring more than talent with us. We bring additional benefits. But the impact of not having disabled people in our workforce is that the workforce is undiverse. It's less diverse than it could be. And of course, it's intersectional. Disabled people aren't all the same. We all have different impairments, but we also have different ethnicities, different genders, different sexual orientations, different cultures. Um, and if we have an undiverse workforce, we have the danger of lack of innovation, of um, groupthink, where everybody who looks the same violently agrees with each other because they all have the same mindset, the same thinking styles, uh, the same things that they uh, aspire to, um, and they make the same decisions, which is great for that group of people, but is likely to exclude other groups of people. And of course, they could be customers. And uh, disabled people, uh, as I think I might have said, and our families and our uh, friends spend, you know, over 100 and, uh, 250 billion pounds a year just in the UK. So if you're missing out on that uh, market, you know, you could be missing out on an awful lot of money. And um, a lot of the customers will be disabled. So you need to have inside information, inside intelligence on what those customers need and how to access them. And you won't have that if you have an undiverse uh, workforce. So the impact of that fear is great for disabled people themselves, but also for businesses, for the economy, for society in general, for health services. You know, it's, it's really not good news at all. But the good news is that there are ways of overcoming that fear. And the benefits of doing that are really the reverse of everything I've said before. If we remove the barriers for disabled people, we remove the barriers for everyone. So um, an accessible recruitment process doesn't just make your jobs more accessible to disabled people, it makes them more accessible to all of the talent that you want to attract. And in fact, not having that fear around disability and seeing it as an asset rather than as a problem means that you become a talent magnet, not only for disabled people, because if disabled people know that they're gonna be welcome in your organization, then they will apply. But also talent generally, uh, we talk about the millennials. I have two daughters who are millennials and I know that they and their, their peers very much when they're looking for work, look to see if the employer is making a social impact and an environmental impact. They're not just worried about the salary and how many days annual leave they're going to, to have. They really want to work for an organization that's ethical, that's inclusive, that's open where people can be themselves. And people with different thinking styles bring with them new ways of looking at things, innovation. The whole social of model dis of, of disability is about people having to overcome barriers that are in their way. So going to the town for a shopping trip might be more complicated for some disabled people. They might have to map out the route. Is the transport going to be accessible? Is there going to be suitable car parking? Are the businesses that I want to visit going to be accessible? Um, and if not, I need to find another way around that. So disabled people are really good at creative problem solving, at looking at different ways of doing things. And if ever we needed people who are familiar with different ways of doing things, it's post COVID, post pandemic uh, business life. And all of that translates to more money, more resources, less sickness absence, um, more engagement, more productivity, more customers. So it's got to be a good thing to do. So there are lots of benefits in removing that fear. But as we said at the beginning, it's a natural fear. How do we how do we get over that fear? So there are lots of ways. The, the best way is by education. So let's challenge some of those myths. Actually, disabled people are far li less likely to be off sick on average than non-disabled people. We're likely to stay in our jobs longer. We're just as productive as non-disabled people. 
we bring additional um, skills with us like um, creative problem solving, like resilience, like thinking of things in different ways, like challenging the status quo. So education and, and actually finding out the facts behind those myths. Also talking to us, you know, we're not frightening people, we'll answer questions, we would delight in a conversation about the barriers we face, how we can reduce those barriers, how they can be removed. The easiest way for a recruiter to make a disabled person feel comfortable is to say, what do you need us to do so that you can thrive in this process? The easiest way a manager can learn what a disabled team member needs is to say, um, what do we need to do so that you can thrive in this workplace? And they'll tell you, and it won't be the elephant in the room, it will be an ordinary conversation. The other way to remove the fear is by leadership and allyship, and certainly by ally leaders becoming allies. So help us, be led by us, but help us talk about this issue. Make it as ordinary as talking about what was on EastEnders last night or what the weather's doing this afternoon, so that mental health disability doesn't become something that's uh, a taboo subject. It becomes an ordinary everyday subject. And lead by example. If you're disabled yourself and you're a senior leader, try and be open about it, you know, because then people will say, well, I can get there too. They're impaired. They might have mental health issue, autism, whatever it might be. I can get there too. Most disabilities, as we know, are invisible. So even if you're not disabled yourself, model inclusive behavior, model the way that we can include everybody, particularly at a time when there might be hybrid working and some people are working from home and some people are in the office. So, so to sum up, really, what I'm trying to say is, if you feel that fear, don't feel bad about that. That's an ordinary human condition. But try and replace that fear with curiosity, learning more about the subject, engaging with more disabled people so that it becomes normal rather than something that's really weird and, you know, the elephant in the room. Care about people. We're all different. We all have things with us, whether we're disabled or not. And replace that fear with questions, talk to disabled people, have open conversations. If you don't know something, that's fine. Don't pretend to know it. Ask the question and find out. So really what I'm saying is, you know, you might be frightened of disability. You might be frightened of getting it wrong. But actually, it's well worth working hard to replace that fear with a much better understanding, much more openness. And we'll reap all of those benefits that I talked about. So thank you for listening and that's me done. <laughs> Jane, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, I'm going to bring this to a close in, in a moment. I, Jane, I don't know if there's any closing words that you'd like to have. Yeah, I think um, I, I might've mentioned it earlier, but I think if there's one takeaway, it's that both employers and disabled candidates need to understand that disabled candidates are premium candidates. You know, Claire, Bethany, you bring things with you over and above what non-disabled people do. That's not meant to be discriminatory against non-disabled people, but we have the same diversity of skills and experience and qualifications and all the rest of it as everybody else um, on the planet, but we have that additional life experience that means that we've learnt all sorts of techniques to um, you know look at different ways of overcoming barriers of being resilient of you know problem solving of communicating our needs to people that actually if employers recognize that disabled people were premium candidates and premium employee employees there wouldn't be any barriers because they would remove them because they want us to work for their organizations and if disabled candidates all recognized how much we bring with us that's over and above then we would be much more confident when we're looking for work and we wouldn't limit our own expectations and we would go for things that we ab absolutely can do um, so i think it is very much about changing the narrative disabled people aren't objects of pity we are very resourceful people who have different challenges to other people that's all we're not frightening and on that note Jane, thank you very, very much. And thank you to everybody who's joined and stayed to the end of this uh, event. You've given us a lot to, to, to think, think about, and I feel very humbled, actually. So thank you to everybody. Please come back next time, the 18th of February, and put in your calendars for the, the third Thursday of each month when we're going to be 
looking at different aspects of diversity and inclusion. Thank you, everybody. Go well, go safely.